within probably the last year because it's oh, okay. pretty good. So let me go through um, old, the, uh, the presentation. You know how the the research report and the presentation is going to be done. It's probably going to take about a half hour, and then Sarah Mattel is going to come in, and she's going to walk you through how to pull the data. You know from uh, from the uh, from the library. Okay. Cortland, Cortland, did you do this with me already? No, it's on. no they turned off on the iPad. Yeah, that's right, but you haven't done this part yet. So this is kind of come in handy with your, uh, for your um, CFA challenge. Yeah. Are you going to be able to work on the Thursday night? I don't know. No? I don't yeah. know yet. I'll let you know by tomorrow. Yeah, that'd be awesome if yeah. you can. Okay. Um, so you guys have it, so you need to pay attention because the, these things are very specific. Is any, uh, have any of you, do any of you know what a pitch book is? Do you guys know what a deck is? Are we looking at it? Yep. <laughs> You're looking at it. How many people are marketing majors? Okay, marketing majors, you're going to be doing this stuff. Uh, how many people are finance majors? Okay, you guys are going to be doing this stuff too. Everybody's going to be doing that. Exactly. You got it. Everybody's going to be doing these. Okay. Do, they, uh, do you do any of these in any of your classes? Similar. We've done like SWOT analysis. And no, no, no. Have you ever. Uh, Produced a uh, deck. Broken, yeah. 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 Okay. All right. um, yeah, you guys need to know how to do this stuff. And this is a very specific uh, pitch book. Okay. That's a pretty nice deck, isn't it? Pretty. Yeah, I went over it like four times. It's pretty good. Um, um, usually, uh, what you're going to need to do is work with me to get the pitch book in position so I can sign off on it. And then once I say, okay, you're ready to go to production, then you're going to go um, to the uh, to the print shop underneath the PowerPoint and have it printed out in color, and you're going to bind it. And then you have to decide, you know, do you make one copy to submit to me, or do you make uh, four copies, one that goes to me, and then the other three that goes to your teammates. Um, do you think you could show this to a potential employer for an internship uh, or a job that shows, you, shows them the quality of work that you can put together? Yeah. Okay. So that's really what the memos and the pitch book is supposed to do is to give you tangible product that you can use within the interview process. Okay? Some of the students get a little carried away because they kind of blow this stuff off at the end of the semester and they blow off my memos. And when they end up getting like a B plus or an A minus in the class and they don't get an A because they did all the extra credit and all that other stuff, they yell at me because I didn't give them an A in the class um, because they basically blew off the memos and they blew off the so they ended up doing a really bad job of this. This is what gets you over um, the goal line. Okay, so this is very specific. And you probably want to take notes, okay, as I'm doing this, even though I'm recording it. And you're going to want to take really good notes when Sarah gets here, too, because she's going to be able to show you where to get the data. And then the data that you pull tonight, you're going to give to me on Wednesday, and we're going to do the analysis, okay? And then hopefully next week, You'll start putting the deck together, all right, all right, and you'll go on your little, you know, Thanksgiving vacation to basically binge eat turkey, right, for a week, and then you're gonna um, come back, and you got like one more week of regular classes, when, which is when you're gonna do the presentations, and then you're gonna come back for the final, and then we're done. We're gonna present the pitch book to the class. Yep. Right, the day. You're gonna do the presentation on uh, Wednesday. Right, not this Wednesday, not next Wednesday, but the Wednesday when you get back. Okay. Right. And how long are the presentations? At least 15. Okay, how much? Okay, anybody else? 15. Uh, anybody else? Around 30. Uh, anybody else? As long as you need a pitch. No, no, no. Uh, what's the optimal time period for a presentation? Seven. Particularly a pitch book. Yeah. It's like five, six minutes. Seven minutes works. Eight minutes, you start to lose the audience. Ten minutes, you don't know what you're doing. Okay? You're just reading from the slides. Okay? So the optimal time period is between basically seven. Seven is like the optimal. So you can get away with eight, but you're pushing it. Six is probably the uh, six, seven is the best. Five, you're moving a, a little bit quick, but most of us have ADD anyway, so we think really fast. It gives 
get to the chase, walk us through, and then that way at the end we'll do Q&A for 10 minutes. Okay, so that's kind of it. So this, this is how it's supposed to look. Uh, it's a clear cover, okay? Not opaque, but a clear plastic cover. And the uh, print shop's going to have the uh, materials for you to be able to produce this exactly like this, okay? Don't deviate from the standard format, okay? And it's clear, so you can look right through it, and right off the bat, I know what company you're analyzing, what your recommendation is, what the intrinsic value is, what the current stock price, the discount or premium, and then who your team is. Okay? I don't want anything mentioned on here about St. Mary's. I don't want anything on here about the class. I want it so that if anybody looks at this stuff, they'll think that you, um, they'll think that you produced it on the job or in grad school. Okay? So we're trying to get over it. And then um, the, this is a plastic wire covered, black covered wire binding. This is exactly what you want to use. And you want to have a black back, okay? Just like this, all right? So that's exactly what the product is going to look like. Then as I said, on the and you want to use Arial. You don't want to use Times Roman, okay? So use Arial font. Um, and then I just went over the cover page, okay? And then you're going to have the overview of the presentation. This presentation is a little bit out of order, um, but I can always rearrange it um, when you come to do the presentation because you're going to bring me a draft of it and during the or you can even come to see me in my office hours and say, Professor Susan, will you take a look at my presentation and make any you know formatting corrections or check the work and see if you know see how it is. Um, then you got your overview. Uh, you got a little company background. I probably wouldn't go right into leadership right there. Um, I would probably go into culture and values uh, right after the little background. I would probably do the SWOT analysis next. And then I would get into leadership. Then I would get into market segments, business lines. Maybe even an org, org chart could do, suffice. I need a uh, I need a, a, uh, I need a page on products and services provided by the company. So a combination of the org chart, business segments, and the product types. Um, I get a very quick read on the comparative advantages and disadvantages of the company. I know where the majority of the revenues are coming from by business segments. And from the product slide, I know exactly where the majority of the revenue is being driven. Uh, not only the majority of the revenue, but what pro new products and services have been created to grow revenues and earnings. So very quickly, I can get an idea of their comparative advantage and disadvantage. Okay, uh, you had a question? Oh, I was just going to see, just to clarify, is the SWOT, you said the SWOT analysis has to go second? Yeah, I would probably do, after, I would do company background, Maybe culture and values, SWOT analysis. I would get, then do the leadership. Then I would get into mark, maybe org chart or market segment, business segment, so I know where the majority of the revenue is coming from, and then a product slide. You know, get telling me what products and services the company offers and which ones contribute the most to the revenue and which ones are growing the fastest. Isn't this all? Actually, this presentation is basically a mid-program capstone. Does everybody know what a capstone is? Yeah. yeah, the capstone is the last strategic planning class that you take in the last semester of your program. I basically have taken that class, that approach, and brought it up into your junior year so that hopefully by doing this now, uh, you'll be able to go through the next, you know, maybe one and a half years and not have to wait till the end to see how your business program all works together, you see how your business program all works together now to be able to value a company. Because at the end of the day, isn't valuing the shares and valuing the company one of the most important things you can do? Yeah, right? We're gonna go we're gonna go work for companies. Don't we want to know what the value of the share is? You're gonna be getting grants and options. Don't you want to know what the stock price is gonna be worth? Yeah. 
I mean, Eric, I mean, if you do it right and go with the right company, your, you know, your call options will be in the money. You know, your grants will be in the money. You'll be able to liquidate them in five years and buy a house in Nevada, right? <laughs> Which is what I did. You know, I, I basically, you know, got grants and options in a, in a company. I held them. I reinvested the money. The money grew at 10% per year over the last 15 years. You know, doubled my money more, took some of that money, used it as a down payment for a house. You know, so it's, it's huge. Leadership is really important too, right? <clears throat> and then this is exactly how the leadership is going to look. So are these nice pictures? Yeah. Yeah. They're, you know, they're Photoshop cropped to make them look normal. They don't look like Gumby or some kind of alien from Mars. <laughs> you know, they look like really nice pictures. This is, you know, really nice produced report, you know. Um, so you have obviously the names of the individuals, what their title is, how long they were with the bank, or how long they've been with the bank, and where they did their JD or MBA. Where do you think the majority, and this is actually Goldman Sachs, we're doing JP Morgan. Where do you think the majority of the senior executives came from? Ivy League. Exactly. exactly, they went to MIT, Harvard, Wharton, Stanford. Mostly East Coast uh, schools, okay? Will that tell you a lot about their culture? Yeah, exactly. Okay, and their competencies. Yes, sir. Can you use the information from their LinkedIn profiles? No, you're going to pull it off of Mergent. When, and we're going to use like four sources. We're going to use Mergent, uh, S&P Net Advantage, Value Line, and uh, Morningstar. So you'll be able to get all the information from there. And tonight when Sarah gets here, we're going to dump the data. So we're going to get all the data tonight so that when we come in on Wednesday, we can start the analysis, okay? Hopefully we can wrap up the analysis by Wednesday or, you know, Monday of next week. You guys will be able to start working on the pitch book and the deck. And then by the time you get back or before you leave on your vacation, you'll be able to show me a draft of the deck um, so that we can then start moving forward to do a, a presentation on the Wednesday before finals week. That's the goal. So I'm starting, usually I only give two weeks for this, but most students complain that I wasn't giving them enough time. So now I'm giving you three weeks to do it, okay? <clears throat> and then uh, the finals night. The finals, when is our final? When's the final? Did I, did I mess up and do put it wrong on the syllabus? <gasps> syllabus, is that a good place to go to find that? So when, when's, the, when's the final? Monday, December 9th. Oh, it's Monday? Yeah. 6 p.m. Monday, wow, Monday, Monday. A month. Is that right? Monday? So I think, I, and when's the other, when's the other final for the other class? Same day, just earlier. Yeah, and I think I have my last final on Wednesday for 136. So then what we usually do on Wednesday, the, uh, the week of the finals, from two to four, we go over to the Metro in Lafayette, which is in the parking lot where the Whole Foods is, and we binge eat on burgers, you know, <laughs> and stuff like that, and have a little, like, you know, semester end party, okay? Is that cool? Thank you. Yeah, Thank you're you. welcome. I do that every semester now. It costs a fortune, but it's totally worth it. And it's a little emotional during the fall semester because I don't see most of the students ever again. Okay. Oh, really? Yeah. We'll be seeing you. Huh? We'll be seeing you. Oh, thank you. Okay, so culture is values. So make sure that you really focus on the leadership, get those boxes correct. Make sure that the leaders actually look like them. leaders. And then here's the business segments. So it basically gives the business segments and it gives the percentage of the revenue contribution by business segment. And some people have put done org charts too. You guys should be passing around <clears throat> the deck so that you have basically a nice sample, you know, of, um, of examples. Okay. Then here, here's your SWOT analysis. Okay. Some people just take the SWOT analysis, you know, from Merge it and some of the others. But you may, after you do the research on J.P. Morgan, you might want to add something. But that's a really nice chart, right there. That's really nice. I probably went over this like four times. Okay. So don't forget, it's your memos in the pitch book. So 
So here's the um, financial rank rankings. These are the top five banks in the United States, and probably globally too, okay? By assets. So these are the top five banks. This is the peer group, okay? Uh, JP Morgan r ranks what? Number one. Number one. These top five banks control 50% of all bank assets in the United States. These top five banks. It's an oligopoly, okay? It's, it's kind of a cartel, okay? <laughs> um, in a sense. But it's really an oligopolistic um, industry structure because these top five banks control over 50% of all assets within the banking system. So they're extremely powerful, extremely competitive, um, and they're very well, well run um, institutions. Okay? And we're going to use these, uh, these assets. We're going to update them from 2018. Um, and then we're going to sum them up, divide them back, and uh, take the weights, and use the weights to calculate the weighted average financial ratios. Counting, right? We're going to use the weights to calculate the, the weighted average financial ratios for the peer groups and the different financial ratios. Okay? And then do the financial ratio analysis. So the next one is the financial condition and financial ratio analysis, which basically this is your first step in fundamental securities analysis when you do the financial ratio analysis to basically assess the overall financial position and condition of the firm. Okay? So that's the first step. So here we have our subject firm, then we have our direct competitor, then we have the peer group, which is the weighted average financial ratios. So you're gonna have to do a, probably an Excel spreadsheet for that. And then you're gonna have your industry ratios. And then what you're gonna do is you're gonna analyze these financial ratios on a row by row basis, and then code them, okay? So if JP Morgan, you, could, you probably want to use Bank of America as J.P. Morgan's direct competitor, okay? But what you're going to do is you're going to look at, let's say, ROA and ROE for J.P. Morgan and compare it to Bank of America. And if the financial ratio is significantly higher from a performance standpoint than the direct competitor in the peer group, you're going to give an excellent condition. If the uh, financial ratio is basically at or slightly above the peer group, you're going to give it a good, okay? You're not going to give it rad or awesome or gnarly or, you know, that thing is bad. You know, you've got to give them these, these codes, okay? Excellent, good. Um, if the financial ratio for the subject firm is above the industry, you're going to give it an above average. If it's at the industry, you're going to give it an average. And if it's below the industry, you're going to give it a poor. Okay? Um, these firms are really good firms. They're not going to have poor ratios. This is not Deutsche Bank or some of the European banks. Um, these are probably going to be above average good or probably excellent. Okay? So then once you code them, you basically step back and you look at the conditions. And if it's maybe a couple excellence and three goods, then your overall financial condition and position of the firm so that's your first sampling of the financial ratios, and then you're going to do it again, right? Another set, and then you're going to code them, you analyze them, code them, step back, look at the overall financial position and condition of the firm, and get an overall financial condition and position. If the overall financial condition and position of the firm is good, then that basically tells you that the underlying fundamentals of the firm are solid from a valuation standpoint. Then you get into the first valuation technique. Now this is not a fundamental valuation method. This is a technical method using technical analysis, which you've already learned a little bit about. Uh, so what you're gonna do is you're gonna go to stockcharts.com. You're gonna go back three years and you're gonna basically look at the company's price pattern and identify the support, resistance, trend lines, the accumulation, consolidation, the trading range, if it's in any. And then what you're going to do is you're going to make a projection based off the slope of the line of what you think the overall momentum is for that stock price and project where you think the stock price is going to be at this time next year. So 
either it's going to be you know, above where it is, below where it is, or flatlined where it is, or some, some slope between there. Then based off of that target price that you came up with, you're going to put it right there. Target value should be target price compared to the current price. And you're going to calculate the premium or the discount. And then you're going to look at your technical analysis. You're going to look at the RSI and the MACD, which are these two lines up here. You're going to look at the trading volume. You're going to look at trend. And you're basically going to write some comments over here in the margin giving some type of support to your technical analysis. So that's the first. Okay. And then what you're going to do is you're going to conduct, conduct the analysis, the valuation, using the perpetuity approach. This box right here, you're going to come up with what it shows you here is how you calculated the discount rate. Okay. The discount rates. Okay. So there's three ways of calculating the discount rate sensitivities. One is using CAPM, capital asset pricing model, to get the expected return on the equity. The other is to use the long-term average annual uh, appreciation rate in the S&P 500 index. Uh, it gives you an expected return. And then the last is you use the weighted average cost of capital uh, uh, using WAC. Okay, and we'll do that too. So I'll walk you through those methods and show you how to calculate the discount rates. And then here you have your projected uh, earnings per share. Now what we're going to do is we're going to do two projections. We're going to finish out 2019 and we're going to project earnings per share for 2020. And we're going to use 2020 as the cash flow metric to value the stock. Okay? So you'll have 2018, 19, and 20. 19 and 20 will be estimates. Then you're going to take the discount rates from low to high, and you're going to divide them into the 2020 earnings per share to get the intrinsic values from high to low, and pick the mid one. You take that mid one right there, put it right up there where it says intrinsic value, compare it to the current stock price, and calculate the premium or discount. Now for the Gordon Growth Model, same CAPM table, same earnings per share table. The only thing that's different is you have the discount rate sensitivities and the constant growth rate sensitivities. So this is your valuation metric. Okay? And then you're going to pick the midpoint here and probably the 1% scenario. Put that there and calculate your premium or your discount using the second intrinsic valuation method. Then what you're going to do is you're going to put together a PE multiple grid here that shows 2018, 19, and 20, 19 and 20 estimate price earnings ratios or multiples for the five companies for the peer groups. And that's going to give you an idea of what the multiple sensitivities are going to be, okay, that you're going to come up with. And you're going to rank those from high to low. And you're going to multiply it against the 2020 earnings per share projection to get the intrinsic value sensitivities using the PE multiple or the multiple approach. Okay. Then what you're going to do next is the discounted cash flow approach, which is the fourth of your fundamental valuation approach. You're going to calculate the weighted average cost of capital, which is the third method of calculating the discount rate. You're going to project out the earnings per share for 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, and 25 to get the terminal value. Then you're going to add the terminal value to the last year in the holding period's cash flow and divide it by you know, 1.0809, whatever the discount rate is to get the discounted cash flows right here. You're going to sum up these discounted cash flows, and they're not only going to match that intrinsic value, but that intrinsic value, and that intrinsic value up there. So what I'm doing with a lot of these uh, uh, methodologies is I'm checking to see if you understand them, and then I'm double checking the verification and validation of them, and then you calculate the discount or the premiums. And then, this all should look familiar to you, because we already went through this 
um, on the midterm. So then you have basically your intrinsic valuation. Models here, the intrinsic values, the three weighting scenarios with the, your target weighting scenario in the middle. It calculates your final intrinsic value with your recommendation right there. That one should match that one, and you have your premium rate discount calculation. <clears throat> then the last, second to last, or second slide or the next slide is your recommendation. Your recommendation, intrinsic value compared to current stock price with your discount or premium. You got your total trades for the index, which is your financial services index, financial services ETF, and your stock for a total number of 12 trades. Then here you're going to have all the references here and more of all the references. And then what I require now is that the very last slide is each of your names with your title underneath it, portfolio manager, senior equity analyst, equity analyst. And then you have basically another line with slashes where you're going to put in the date and you're going to sign it. Because if you're a a CFA, Chartered Financial Analyst, and you do a piece of research like this, um, you have to sign off on the research basically stating that you used all the available information uh, available to you. You used all of your knowledge to the best of your ability to be able to produce the research to make the recommendation within the time period that was provided to you. Okay? So that's basically it. That's it. All right, any questions on this? Everybody clear on what we're doing? Well, uh, well, the answer is either yes or no. <laughs> yes. Yes. What? Yes. Yes. Yeah, because we went through a lot of this stuff on the quiz, on the midterm, and now we're doing the application. And we're going to calculate it in class. We're going to go over it in class so that you can put it in the pitch box. Okay? So you're not all doing it individually. So does that make it a little bit easier? Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. So the hardest part is actually working with your team psychology and to be able to produce the deck of a high quality and actually get it produced. What I would do is I would pick who your production manager is, who's going to be in charge of making sure that the thing is produced and shown to me um, in high quality. I would have a financial analyst um, and I also have a marketing person. So one person is going to oversee the process, the other person is going to oversee the production and the marketing of the document and the other person's going to um, do the financial analysis to make sure that everything was done correctly. Okay? Does anybody know Sarah Vitell? Does everybody know Sarah? Sarah. Sarah's awesome. Sarah, I brought you another chocolate bar. Yes. Now she's got three. The last one was. Oh, you did? You already ate it? Oh, half a lot. Oh. I don't think that one's going to last very long. Here, you might want to um, pass this one around because this one's pretty good. Too. Okay. So this is what we're going to do now. <clears throat> so Sarah is going to walk us through. You guys are going to need to follow through on your computers. You're going to follow along, and you're going to download the data so that on Wednesday, when you get back, you're going to have all of the data to feed to me so that we can do the calculation and pump this thing up and get it done in a night so that then you guys can work on it the following week and get me some drafts as close to production quality before you leave on vacation. Come back the following Monday to show it to me so that you can do the presentation, right, on that Wednesday. And then the final, what we're going to do on the final night, the final night is mandatory. You're going to come back on the final day Right, with your deliverable three and any other makeup work that you might not have completed, we're going to eat cheesecake for like a half hour, maybe watch, you know, you know, some rock and roll film or something. And then you're going to hear me lecture for about 40 minutes to 60 minutes, going over a seven module system that took me 15 years to de develop that basically gives you the intellectual infrastructure that you will need to move forward decisively in both your academic and your professional careers and allow you or hopefully provide you with the intellectual infrastructure to make decisive decisions and know that the decisions that you're making in your life 
both academically, professionally, and personally, know that you're making the right decision because you can't afford to make any mistakes because you don't have a time machine. So you have to know that the de decisions that you're making based off of your knowledge are correct so you can move forward decisively to make the decision, to execute it, and then see the positive outcomes associated with your execution. Okay? All right. So, Sarah, I'll let you go. Okay. Next. Yeah, no pressure or anything. I used to work with the um, kinesiology students, and I was always worried that, you know, I don't, I don't have a medical background. So, gosh. If I help them find the right, wrong article and they do some kind of treatment on an athlete and it hurts the athlete, they're going to ruin their career. And I just, I felt like, oh my God, that's the worst thing I could do. And then I started working with business. I'm like, wow, if I give you the wrong information and you make the wrong choices, you can sink the whole economy. <laughs> no pressure. That's so the econ students. It's, it's the econ student in me. It's like, oh, gosh. Um, yeah, so financial data can go wrong. And you don't want it to go wrong because hurt one athlete, terrible. Hurt the entire global economy real bad. So we want to get you the right data so that you can do your magic and be smart and make these really great decisions. Um, so follow along on your computers. We're in the library homepage. So I'm going to show you the different databases we subscribe to that will get you the information you need quicker and more efficiently. So there's that. So on this page, you've probably seen, if you've seen me in classes before, under research help, there's a link to research guides and then one for business. There isn't one for finance under the business administration page. And under company information, this is the big one we'll spend most of our time on because it is the big one that's the most important. Um, actually, MBA, the graduate business professors don't usually want their students using Mergent Online because it's too easy. Um, they want them to go the old fashioned way to get all the data by hand just so they know how it's, how it's um, all out there. So if you go for an MBA, you'll use different sources. But Mergent Online, their tagline is, may result in um, ex excess time, which is true. It will save you a lot. So click on Mergent. And here's a couple tricks of using Mergent. And the other question I always get is, are the numbers correct? Well, they are as reported. So if you were looking at Enron numbers from 2000, they would not be correct. But they would be as correctly as reported. You'll want to get a list of your tickers. So all of your banks are publicly traded. So one of your tickers is BAC. Yeah, let's do uh, JP Morgan first. Let's start, start that one. Because that's our subject um, company. JPM, I just did some of your work for you. There is your ticker for JP Morgan Chase. And then who's the competitor that we're doing? Who's the direct competitor? Bank of America. Uh, yeah, B of A. So we're here. I'll just show you this, and then I'll show you how to create some, some lists, which I'm going to do as we go. So this is everything you need to know about J.P. Morgan Chase. Um, it's got some quick, quick hitting data up at the top. Um, it is live, so it is updated all the time, or at least as, as they have the data to report it. So um, this last one was, last time it was reported was the end of last year. So they'll be getting that new one soon. Here's a little business summary so you can see what they do. Um, here's the list of executives. Can so you send me a picture somewhere? Some, some of them do. Let's see if this guy has his picture. He makes yes. more than 1.5 million. Yes, he does. Oh, that's nothing. He makes. No, he actually makes more than There you go. His total compensation yeah. is 30. 30 million. <laughs> so, yes, it says the compensation there is salary. The total compensation, it's good to be this guy. That's a lot more than I have in JP. You know, you're the largest Bank. financial institution you know, in the United States. Yeah, so you can see uh, you know, his background, where he worked, where he got his degrees. So he's an MBA Harvard. from Harvard. So he's, he's kind of a big deal. If you scroll further down, you can actually see when he has bought and sold stock, or when he's been given and when he has sold stock. So uh, all of that's public. When you get to be the big, the big fish, everybody knows your business. Um, so. You can get some information there about that person. Um, the other officers, you'll see, oops, the other C-suite, you'll see there as well. And you can click on them, and it'll have, have them. Yeah, well. Stay away from the board members. They don't really do much. I mean, they do stuff. Yeah, you want to use uh, division heads, yeah. people who actually run you uh, want revenue. The revenue big ones. people. So. 
and it'll all have that compensation information. Um, the other bit you want are the company financials tab. This is, this is the money maker right here. Company financials. So here is all that stuff they have to report. It also goes back, it defaults to five quarters. You can go to all years available. So this one I think goes back to 1982. We looked at it earlier. Goes back to, yes, 1982. Wells Fargo goes back further because that bank has been in continuous existence for a very long time. Um, it defaults to showing the balance sheet. A lot of what you'll want is on the income statement. I can never remember what's on each. So if you go to all sections, from the balance sheet, you're going to want to get long-term debt and owner's equity for me for uh, next week. So those are the big ones. Or for Wednesday. This is also important, and we 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 troubleshot that troubleshotted troubleshot Shooting. troubleshooted um, in the last class. The other thing you'll need is actually under standardized. So if we click under standardized. And we'll have that same option of all sections or balance sheet or income statement or whatever you want there. All years available, refresh, and this is where we get EPS, basic. So earnings per share basic, you have it historically. And that's the one we're going to need to, uh, so. to get. Yeah. Last class, figured this one out for you. Thank them if you see them. And then there's other stuff here as well. So even though it defaults to as reported, also check out the standardized. Also check out the ratios. Doesn't have every ratio in existence because obviously you, there's a million ratios and you can calculate them yourselves, but these are the big ones that they've already done for you. So you've got your ROA, your ROE, um, loans to deposits, all that kind of good stuff cash flow, flow per share, et cetera, et cetera. So that's what this is, the basic, each one of these, each company will have one of these. If you want to do some quick reports, you can and get your um, competitors and your, your peer group in all in one place, you go up here to this okay, little Before we do that, can we do the, uh, can we export the EPS? Oh, yeah. So this one's easy since we already have it here. Just I want to go back as far as you can. Yeah, so we've got all years available, all sections. Actually, we can. We did know this is in income statement, right? Yep. So that way we won't get as big of a spreadsheet. Um, there we go, download. And we got earnings for sure. Mm -hmm. It'll be in there. It'll be all of them. Everything on this page. All of them. So, and and you, where there it is, EPS basic. basic. Got it. So you can just delete the other other. Okay, all of you need to um, export that and then save it and bring that. Um, and actually, it would be great if somebody could uh, add a row underneath EPS basic and calculate the um, year year to year percentage change. Because we're going to be, what was, what was, what happened in the early 1980s? 82, 84. What happened? You guys remember? Mm -hmm. ah! you, you weren't born. Some big change, I can tell you that. Yeah, it was a recession. What was oh, 91 yeah. to 93? Recession. What was that 2001 to 2003? Recession. What was 89? Recession. What was 08, 09? Recession. recession. Okay. So can I go back in time and look at percentage change in EPS over three business cycles and figure out where EPS growth rates are going to be over the next five years if I know where we are in the business cycle? Yeah. Are, where are we in the business cycle? Are we in a recession? Yep. Yes. About. Oh, really? About to be. Are we? <laughs> yes or no? About to be. Are we in a recession? No. no. Okay. Are we uh, coming out of a recession? Are we in the growth peak phase of the business cycle? Yes. No. Are we in the decline phase of the business cycle? Yeah. Are we? <laughs> What's GDP growing at right now? Uh, 
not negative, it's still positive. Where's unemployment? Where's industrial production? We're not we're at the we're at the growth peak phase. We're not in the decline of trump. Because then stocks just hit an all time high. Like yeah. Awesome. So my point is that can I go back and look at EPS growth rates at the at the growth peak phase, going back three or four business cycles to see what EPS growth rates would be over the next five years? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So I'm using macro factors. Yeah. I'm using a macro factor to be able to project the EPS. Okay. Go ahead. Sorry about that. Okay. So there you go. Once you get your spreadsheet, you can do whatever it is you want. You can make your own formulas, do everything. Um, when you get to be big time finance people, you'll be able to do this kind of work within the data, the data sets. But for now, we just have to work with um, the exports and, and uh, do our calculations with an Excel. We, we will need a, uh, a balance sheet snapshot. You can do that too. Balance sheet, same thing. Download. Oops, I forgot to refresh. Refresh. And then you can do the same thing. With what you got with your spreadsheet. And you're going to need to give me uh, long term debt and owner's equity. Okay, so you can download from there. This is just for JP Morgan. You can start to create fast lists if you want, and this is a, a part that I've never showed you before, even if I've showed you Mergent, and it's not super clear to do it. Once you're in one, if you click that little plus sign, to add to an uh, analyst, analysis list, that'll add it to a list. Do oh, it again, please. That's up here in the corner oh, right. where there's a little plus sign. That's so obvious that we always look past it. Um, what's one of your competitors? BAC. Know your tickers. There we go. So we, we uh, changed company, went right to that same page, but again, we can add to the analysis list. What's your other one? Citibank. Citibank. Okay. Ticker is C. There, did some more work for you. There's city, this is an important one to write down because there's a lot of C groups. You want C. C group C. You don't know what it is. Add to. Uh, yeah, I'll sh we'll show you. So you should be following along so you're building the list. What's another one? Goldman Sachs. Yeah, GS. Goldman Sachs. to our analysis list. Did we add Wells Fargo? Not yet. And that's the last one. Wells Fargo Company. There we go. And we will add that to our list. There we go. So we've got a list. So then it's going to be under Emergent Tools, and we'll see we have a list of five companies or five entities. Okay. Did you all follow that? The other fun thing about this, it defaults to multiple company report, which is, might be one of the least useful things. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's nice, but it, it just it's not going to work for what you want. What you want is to click on company comparison report. That way you can quickly compare the two, or the five companies. Move them all over to your comparison report. Oops. All of them over there, so that all five of them are there. And then you can look in the financials and the ratios for different, these are just like the main, the main things you might want to look at. Um, so there, there was over. nothing in company information that we needed, right? There wasn't, no, it was just like the address and the yeah, order. Yeah, And then we were going to, we need current assets. Oh, no, no, no. I can uh, We need total assets. Okay. We need total assets. So yep. we'll highlight it. Move it over. What other ones? I keep going to go down. Current ratio. We need current ratio. Earnings <laughs> before tax. Uh, EBITDA margin. Gross margin. Uh, interest coverage. Uh, inventory turnover. Uh, get rid of uh, that yeah. one, yeah. Get rid of that guy. Uh, loan to deposits. Long-term debt to equity. Let's just throw in the lo no 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 uh, long-term debt to equity. No no no, you already did that one. Yeah. It's the one down below. LT debt oh, to equity. 
I don't know why there's two. I don't know why it's in there twice. Um, uh, net interest margin. Net interest margin. Uh, profit, net profit margin. Operating margin, uh, quick ratio, quick ratio. Uh, revenue per employee, uh, ROA, ROE, ROI. Well, the R's. Oops. And then do total asset turnover and total debt to equity. All right. And what we suggested earlier is you can export this. It will be the latest. So just do this year or at least the current. Um, you can include the average, and then export it as Excel. There you go. So, lettering. And then let's do, um, let's do one more with the history, just so we have the snapshot, and then one with the history. So that was the <coughs> current one. And then if you want history, which would actually be 2017 on, if you do the, the shift arrow down, you'll select them all. So it basically gives you 10 years. So I'm going to create report. Open. There you go. Okay, so please save those, uh, those Excel spreadsheets and bring them on that. Bring them on Wednesday. So those numbers look right? Yeah. And you're going to need to get uh, bring me the, uh, uh, the beta. I'm going to need the beta for JP Morgan. Um, and then the other thing, Sarah, that we, we were having a hard time finding was the uh, yield maturity of the bonds. Oh, yeah. 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 Y
where you can go for some of this other information. So Mergent is just looking at the data. They don't care to analyze it. They don't care to say whether it's a good company or bad company. They're just in it to give you the data. Morningstar cares about the investment. They care that this is a good thing for someone to put money into. So they're all about the investment stuff. It should have the same data. So let's look at JPM. Because and again, so it's as some reported. Some sources are a little bit different. They some have a little bit well, different stuff. It's how they round something. Um, but mostly what will be different are some of the um, analysis. This will have more qualitative information. Um, it will also have more projecting, because Merchant's not going to do any projecting, because they don't care. They just want to look at the, the here and now, the snapshot. They'll have some projecting as well. They'll also have this um, analysis. So these, these analysts have looked at it, have written about it, have written what's, you know, what's concerning, what's not concerning. Um, we'll give you, you know, what's a, what the prices should be, what's the fair value, what it would the data that. right there. Uh, there's the beta right there at 1.21. Uh huh. Although that sounds high. <laughs> uh, so there you go. Um, below that, you'll get lots of charts. This is all about charts and, and fancy stuff. Advanced and basic. You get the trailing returns. This is one place where you can get the industry ratios for their industry. So banks diversify. This is this is what JP is. This is what the industry is. Down here are the valuations and the growth. Profitability. So some of these you'll get in, in uh, emergent, some of them you won't because again they're they don't they're not interested in projecting. And again the income statements are just going to all be like as reported. Cash flow, I think, is as reported. And the valuation, current five year operating performance, all that kind of good stuff. So you can play around with that as well. And then you get the executives again, but pretty much the same information. And that's it, right? That's pretty much it. Um, everything is on this one page. But look around because they always have like little tabs here, uh, short interest news, you'll always have something hidden there. There's no way to put it all on one page. They try to, but there's still, there's still stuff hidden down, down in there. So you can do the same with all of your other ones. So if you need to look specifically at another one, so Fargo Company, same kind of stuff there. If you get a, an error, and it, or it won't load, or it says not currently available, hit enter again, or reload, and it should come up. They, they made their interface nicer, but they're, they're still very clunky. So here we go. Sometimes it'll have different information than it has than the other. It just depends on what, what that analyst has really been, tr been tracking. This one's a little bit higher rated as a stock. Uh, but it's cheaper, so who knows? Okay, so don't follow me along along with me to this one because we have discovered there is a problem, which I will call them tomorrow about. Um, right now it seems to be only giving us one license at a time, so only one person can be on that advantage at once. Let's see if it lets me on. It doesn't. Um, I will call them about that because it seems to think we're only one person. We're not. We pay for multiple access. Um, so this is Net Advantage, AKA Standard and Poor's, AKA Capital IQ, AKA a bunch of other names. Um, I'll look up JP Morgan Chase. Ah, yeah, this, dang it. It must remember me from last time. I'll fix that. It's got basically the same information. The only thing that it added on this one was the industry surveys which may or may not be useful. We pay you a lot. You need to work. So it's not going to work for me today. <coughs> it's okay. We'll look at value line. So first on my list to call them tomorrow and yell at them. Um, so that would be one source, but honestly, you can 
see it's third on the list for a reason. It doesn't really add that much compared what, to the other two. What's value line research? Value line also don't follow along with me to this one because we only have three seats to this one at a time, which we haven't run into a problem. Everyone does their homework at different times, so it works out. Don't wait till the night before because then everyone's going to be on value line and you're not going to be able to get anywhere. Um, it's like Morningstar, but different set of analysts. Shows it ranked in the industry of the bank. Again, the numbers should be the same, but this one also gives more projections. So merchant doesn't care about projections, the other two do care about it. Up there is the 18 month target price ratings, what, what they should be going for. And so you can just see what's on this screen, what might be useful for you. Long term debt, we've got some there. Book value, industry analysis, they rank. 44, um, and then you can also see who's been selling what and when. I don't, that probably doesn't matter to your project, but I always think it's kind of interesting. If they're all selling at once, they know something. Um, anything else on this one that was interesting? Because we did look at this one earlier. I think it was just the, uh, the target price. So any questions? Lots and lots and lots of data. The last one I'll show you is really hidden. Industry data. So we do have data to compare. So we saw in Mergent, or um, Morningstar, just had that one little line. Um, there are more that you can do, and it is hidden. I should write it here that the RNA stats are in there. Ibis World. This is one of my favorite sources for analysis, but also has, is the only place that has the RMA stats right now. So if we look by banking or bank, open the report for commercial banking, and you'll note they are very recent. So this one was just done in June. They're usually updated every six months or every year, depending on how volatile the industry is. And then all the way over here, key stats what you want. And then go down, there you go. There, there's the big stuff. Industry financial ratios. So it is under industry, under Ibis World, all the way on the back page at the bottom. It's like not super easy to find. There, there it all is. Operating ratios, cash flows, assets. And these are the ratios of what it should be for the entire industry. What did we say we wanted large? Or yeah, we want to do large. Because they're small, medium, and large. No, yeah, it's large. large. They're big. They're over $50 million. Well over $50 million. There you go. And is there like an industry snapshot that we could create a slide out of? Where they just give kind of an industry overview on that first page? Does yeah. So it depends on what you want. Um, this is. I was looking for like just an industry, you know, Probably something that just talks about the industry. Here we go. So, also not clear. So this is I've suggested to them they make it a new tab. Um, they're like, oh, that might be a good idea because no one seems to see it when it's up there, hidden between the print icon and the search button that no one ever uses. I expert. That's that's the snapshot. So you'll see the key revenues of the industry, the market share. So Wells Fargo has 10%, JP Morgan has 8.6%, Bank of America 6.2%. This is the only place you'll get market share. None of the other databases have market share. It's incredibly hard to find market share. Um, external drivers, what products they have, revenue versus employee growth. This is the closest you'll get to a snapshot. Uh, benchmarks. <coughs> cost structures, and then some analysis. Oh, there's the write-up right there. Yeah, there's some. The oh, threats and opportunities. Yeah, we should do an industry uh, page. Yeah, just so you know what's going on. This is my favorite part of it, um, the call prep questions. So like, after you do this and you go and you interview for an internship or a job with a financial company, 
go prepared with some of these questions to ask them. Sometimes I'll ask you these questions, so you get have, first. Ha have an idea of, yeah. of what they might ask you to show that you know the industry. Um, also, if they say, do you have any questions for us? It shouldn't be, do you have a gym membership? That should not be it. It should be something like, what, what extent are your processes automated? You know, make yourself look smart. Um, wow. These are all there ready for you. Hidden away in this little thing up in the corner. We've got to put it in the tab. Someday they'll listen to me. Um, but it's under iExpert. So you can't know your company without knowing it's your industry. How do they decipher bad data? I mean, like any database, there's always like some bad data. Like how is it? They, well, they take everything that's reported. And then, like this person, at least these are named. So this is an analyst who just studies that industry. And that's his job. He checks data all day, all night, all the time. Checks data and then makes these reports. So, I mean, they'll, very rarely do I think the industry analysts find problems, but I don't think an industry analyst brought down Enron for bad data, but they may have. They may have noticed some, some things not looking just lots of eyes on it. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? All right, here is your data. This particularly, this you don't get Google. Google's not gonna get, well, Google will find it and then they'll make you pay for it. So um, the iExpert and the whole in IDIS World packages, yeah. each one of these reports is about six to $8,000. Oh so gosh. this is the stuff you get what you pay for. This is, this is the good stuff. The other data you can usually find other places for free, but it's packaged really well. This you're not gonna find anywhere else. This, this is a subscription only. Same with the Morningstar analysis. That's heavy subscription stuff. Well, yeah. just a general question, but how much, or how long do we have access if we're seniors <laughs> after? Uh, how long do you have access yeah, to it? Yeah, like the day we graduate? Or? Until they take you out of the, uh, what they call the LDAP system, so how you log in with your username and password. And I've heard it takes eight months. So use it until you can't anymore. <laughs> is, there, is there an alumni association here? There is, but these will not allow us alumni access. Oh, okay. For obvious reasons. <laughs> because I tried. these are super valuable. If you happen to stay in the area, come back and see us. Because as long as you're in that building, you can use anything. Um, it's just the remote okay. login. We got them to at least do that because we made the argument, who's going to drive out to Moraga? Like, oh, you're right. Yeah, anyone in the building can use it. That's how we got around it. Um, and also check your public libraries. Um, Walnut Creek had the, or Contra Costa Library, Walnut Creek has um, Morningstar. They subscribe to that. All right, any other questions? This is the good stuff, so use it. It's there to be efficient and effective and get you the best possible stuff. Can you, can yeah. you go over the career resources for, for professional development? Um, yeah, so it, I just I know Dr. Sousa <laughs> make us do uh, yeah. the resumes and stuff. Mm -hmm. yeah. it, that just links to the career services over in SIBA, those people. Uh, but we do link to IBIS World for those same uh, questions, the call prep questions. And the same thing with Vault Career Intelligence. These are also some industry reports but mostly from the career job seekers point of view and not like the heavy, what is going on in the industry, that you'll need for um, this class. Uh, I just world will be best for that. That's just if you're curious of, should I get a job with a bank? They'll probably say yes. Um, this will be more detailed. So <coughs> usually financial institutions are subscribed to these things, right? Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Um, they have different names, so um, I know the merchant feed goes, a lot of financial companies have their own little ticker system happening on their, their, um, their networks, and a lot of it is merchant data. It just isn't called merchant. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the big companies aren't relying on Google for that. They get, it, they get it from the good stuff coming to them. Any other questions? All right, anything to add? Happy hunting.
start early because you never know when you're going to run into a database like Standard & Poor's not working properly. Um, Virgin's pretty good. Ibis World's yet to die on us, so they're, they're my friends in my book. Uh, Morningstar can be a little wonky sometimes. Um, so, And if it's not working, let me know because that could be just a sign something's wrong and I need to um, call them and tell them they need to fix it. We pay for it. <laughs> Thank you, Sarah.